Angry farmers have swept Europe. Thousands of tractors have been used to block highways, bringing major cities to a standstill in protest at rising costs, heavy bureaucracy and foreign imports. So can the EU find a fair solution to their grievances? I'm Neil Harvey and today's newsmakers are protesting farmers in Europe. The scale and fury of the protests have taken European governments by surprise. And that anger reached a climax last week when farmers drove their tractors into the heart of the European Union. Well, EU leaders were talking about aid for Ukraine. Farmers outside the European Parliament were revolting against high costs, low wages, environmental regulations and cheap imports. The farmers have already won some concessions from their governments and the EU Yet that wasn't enough to keep them off the streets as the protests have continued to expand. So how can EU countries strike a balance between their crucial policies and the needs of the farmers? We'll discuss that and more in just a minute. But first, here's a closer look at the protesters and their demands. Tractors have taken over the streets across Europe. Thousands of farmers have been protesting the policies which put them in dire conditions. While different countries have their unique problems, Europe's farmers share some common grievances. One of them is the rising business costs. The conflict in Ukraine has increased the prices of fertilizer, energy and transport, putting extra pressure on farmers. Since the Russian invasion, the EU has waived the import quotas and tariffs for Ukrainian agricultural products. Farmers, especially the ones in Eastern Europe, say cheap imports create an unfair competition. Adding insult to injury, a planned agreement between the EU and South America's Mercosur trade bloc would see more agricultural products flooding into European markets, with little or no tariffs imposed. The agricultural sector accounts for 11% of the EU's carbon emissions, which the bloc wants to reduce for its net zero goal by 2050. To achieve that, the EU has proposed changes and conditions to get farming subsidies. This has angered many. The new regulation would include an obligation to leave 4% of farmland idle, carry out crop rotations, and reduce fertilizer use by 20%. In Germany, the farmers are also unhappy with the government's plan to phase out tax breaks on agricultural diesel. In Portugal and Spain, the governments have issued water restrictions for agricultural areas owing to severe drought in the region. Last week, thousands of farmers across Europe carried their grievances into Brussels as EU leaders met to discuss aid to Ukraine. Angry protesters filled the streets with tractors, threw eggs at the EU Parliament and set fires. The European elections are coming and politicians are super nervous, so also the European Commission. And I think that is the best moment that together all the European farmers go to the street and show our necessities. The EU has delayed its proposed changes. Germany revised its plan to cut diesel tax breaks for farmers and France promised emergency aid and a fair share of revenue to calm the protests. War is here, the world is changing, and so we have to have more simple agricultural policies that further take into consideration the need to produce more, which of course integrates our environmental goals, but which does so while preserving fair competition, preserving the revenues of farmers and preserving our food sovereignty. That is the change in logic that we want to promote on the European level. The announcements have eased protests in Germany and France, but anger continues to spread. This week, Italy, Greece, Belgium, Latvia and Spain have seen fresh protests, testing the EU's policies on agriculture in the wake of global challenges. OK, let's broaden out this discussion. Joining me now from Hull, UK, is Vice President of the Global Farmer Network and a farmer himself, Paul Temple. From Brussels, we have Isabel Pagliotta, Policy Officer for Sustainable Food Systems at the European Environmental Bureau. 
And joining us from Vilnius is Roger Casale, founder of New Europeans and president of the Europe's People's Forum. Welcome, everyone. I feel it's most appropriate to come to you first, Paul, uh, as a farmer. We're seeing manure dumped on the roads, burning tyres. Growing up, I don't remember farmers being this angry. Are they justified to be this angry? I think many of them are. And I think you, it's, it is quite unusual to see so many countries' farmers protesting at the same time. Believe you me, most farmers would, would prefer to be on their farms working rather than processing. So it is genuinely a real measure of the frustration that so many are feeling for a number of reasons. And what are those reasons? What are they so angry about? Well, they, they range from, uh, it might be depopulation in some of the um, less favoured areas, to the, the way pesticides and genetics are treated, uh, the fact that you are genuinely drowning in bureaucracy. And these are small businesses. So they're not equipped to cope with the kind of administration that people want. And many of them don't even actually have the internet connections that are required to carry administration out. It is hugely frustrating. I speak from my own personal experience. Let's bring in Isabel Pagliotta. Isabel, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said a few months ago on, on um, social media, we have more than enough food to go around and more than enough money to fund sustainable food systems. First of all, just quickly tell us, in a nutshell, what is a sustainable food system and why have we not got them? Yeah, thank you, Neil. Uh, so, yeah, to keep it brief, uh, a sustainable food system is a food system in which everyone in the along the food value chain, from farmers to consumers to workers, get a fair return for their work, uh, can sustain a dignified livelihood uh, and a fair income, and everyone has access to healthy and sustainable food. Um, why haven't we got one? The reason for that, and my focus is primarily on Europe, but uh, this is the case uh, globally as well, is that for the last 60 years at least, we've supported a policy focused on just increasing production, um, whatever the effect on food quality, the environment, or human health. So that's what's called the productivist agricultural system, and farmers are the first victims both of that system and of the environmental destruction it, in, it engenders. You mentioned there uh, about the focus on production. Um, the, the interpretation I got of the common agricultural policy was that it used to focus on production. That's why we got such things as the European Wine Lake and the Butter Mountain. Seemed the focus changed somewhere along the line via one of the, the, the many reforms that they had. Have, have things changed for the worse? Um, well, actually, the, the common agricultural policy reforms over the years have really been limited to, to minor short-term changes and concessions that uh, ultimately haven't, haven't really changed the system. And in fact, yes, have made things more complicated and harder for farmers by sort of creating a incoherent mix between a continued push to produce more for cheap um, uh, while also increasing the administrative burden and in inserting a few environmental requirements that farmers have to have to align with without having been involved in the policy design process, in the policy making process, and without those requirements being part of a more coherent um, transition pathway designed together with 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 actors from the whole uh, food system. Okay, let's bring in Roger Casale now. Roger, just picking up off, off the back um, of what Isabel said there, farmers have, have said that they feel they're in an, an impossible situation because they're expected to keep on producing cheap food, but they're having to do it amid these regulations that demand sustainable farming. Uh, they also complain about unfair competition, which they, some, the ones who are complaining about it say it's coming from these EU agreed free trade agreements. So do the bureaucrats, the EU policymakers have to take responsibility? I think we all have to take responsibility, Neil, and certainly the, that includes the EU bureaucrats. I mean, <clears throat> farmers are part of the team with breadwinners and families for putting food on the table. Uh, let's get down to, to, to the basics here. We, 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 we all need, to, we all need to, to, to eat. I think the tract protest is a great way of grabbing attention. 
And I'm sure Paul's right, farmers would prefer to be on their farms rather than driving their tractors into, into the centre of cities. But let me tell you, I was, I was with two farmers' sons this morning at a school uh, in rural Lithuania. And they told, me, they told me two things. They told me, yes, there are the issues that Paul and Isabella have been talking about, issues about very low prices, issues about land laying fallow. But they also told me, and I think this speaks to your point, Neil, they told me that they felt that they, they weren't being treated fairly and they weren't, weren't get, they, you know, that people weren't talking straight with them, that they had agreements that, that from the past that weren't being um, upheld. Uh, particularly in the Lithuanian case in relation to fallow land and other issues. So, yes, I think that uh, all of us need to do better here. Um, it, it's it's, it's uh, great to see, you know, farmers standing up for themselves. They have to stand up for themselves, and they do that very well. But we have to go beyond attention grabbing and headline grabbing into the complex issues. And as you said, the issues are very complex, and uh, we need a proper constructive conversation about that, um, a dialogue built on trust that actually can produce some solutions. It's really interesting to hear you give in personal, you know, anecdotes of farmers that you've met, which brings me back, back to Paul, because you, you know, you work within and vice president of an organisation of farmers, a network of them um, all over uh, Europe. Um, what, are the, what are the stories that you hear back from them? Are, are farmers complaining just because they feel that they're impoverished? Or are they frustrated by bureaucracy? I, I, there's, a, there's a number of frustrations. But what has been particularly telling is the fact that um, you know, von der Leyen has active, actually said, we're going to have to revisit the kind of ambitions they had because we've basically got it wrong. Now, I think, going back to Roger's point, uh, there's been a lot of frustration with the pesticide targets, green deals, emissions that has been building up without any feeling anybody's being listened to. So there is an opportunity now, effectively, to have a reset. It's a little bit frustrating. It's taking the level of protests and, and, and genuinely nobody wants to disrupt people's lives. But we have an opportunity now to get into some of the detail and, and, and actually talk truthfully about how our future food is going to be produced both within Europe and how it fits into the global trading pattern. And I think one of the frustrations for Europeans is we felt we've been asked to pick up an environmental agenda, which is fine, but we've been subjected to imports that don't have the same restrictions we're working to. Yeah, that's, that's a point that um, has, has come up time and, and, and time again, this feeling that farmers are competing on a on an unfair market that the EU farmers feel they're beholden to certain rules that maybe some of the free trade agreements um, set up much easier situations for other countries. Uh, Isabel, if you were going to, you advise, you and your organisation advise the EU, do you bring these issues up? I mean, what advice do you give to them? Um, yes, uh, so undoubtedly unfair. Um... Unfair competition is a considerable issue for, for farmers in that particularly, I mean, both for farmers in terms of cheap import, but also in terms of our environmental ambitions, if we impose certain standards to our own farmers and then um, ex import uh, food produced with uh, under lower standards and therefore export, by the way, in those countries, our environmental, uh, negative environmental impacts uh, that uh, really is is not a solution um, to to any of our problems, our farmers, and also sustainability, both social and environmental uh, abroad. Um, one thing that um, I'd like to um, add on to uh, in terms of uh, the European Green Deal that was referred to uh, just now by by Paul is. When we look at the ambitions and the targets that the EU referred to four years ago when publishing the Green Deal, those are um, science-backed uh, uh, ambitions and targets. And it's very important that we remember that farmers are the first victims and are well aware of the impact uh, of the impact of the climate uh, change and biodiversity crises. The big issue with how those policies were um, developed was precisely the lack of dialogue, the lack of inclusion of different voices, particularly those of farmers, in the implementation and design of how um, we would uh, work towards the achievement of those ambitions. Because we can't 
imagine a transition to sustainable agriculture and food that does not include the voices uh, of, of all farmers. I want to come back to, to Roger and just pick up off the back of what Isabel said there about the European Green Deal. Um, it, it sounds like you all kind of have a similar uh, belief that more dialogue is needed. But the situation that we have is the European Green Deal is kind of making this difficult situation more complicated, it seems. Do you think, Roger, that uh, the, the Green Deal was a good idea that maybe just came a, along at a bad time? Timing's everything, we say. You, you had the pandemic, then the war in Ukraine, really complicating things. Is it, is it worth putting this on the back burner for a while? Uh, no, I don't think we can put uh, the Green Deal on the back burner. I think that it's, um, it, it came to if anything, too late rather than too early. Um, but it does point to the competing priorities that the EU has. Um, we haven't mentioned Ukraine yet and imports from Ukraine. Um, all kinds of factors, as Paul was saying, Isabel has been pointing out, very complex areas. And we do look to the EU to really try and um, solve the Rubik's Cube of these different priorities in a way that is going to give a fair deal to everybody, including farmers and farmers feel that isn't the case and therefore they're standing up for themselves but let's not just put everything on brussels i mean francis mitterrand the old president of france in, in 1980 used to say that the point of the european union was for french farmers to go and uh, protest uh, in brussels and not in front of the ministry of agriculture but with this kind of protest um they are protesting in brussels and they are protesting here in vilnius where there were tractors on the street in lithuania and in Spain now, and in national, national, at national level as well. And um, you know, we, we, we've really got to at every level, at local level, national level, and European level. We can push the buck around as as much as we like. Um, we can blame other policy areas. We can blame the bureaucrats in Brussels. We can we can play that game as long as we like. It's not going to help farmers. It's not going to help consumers. It's not going to get us further down the road. So there has to be. A dialogue has to be listening, there has to be trust in that relationship. One thing that I'm, um, concerns me is that, you know, Trump, we're hearing a little bit from, from farmers that the trust is not there in the relationship. We do need, people, you know, trust about listening to people. It's about keeping your promises. And it, it's, about, it's not about caving into concessions. It's about finding solutions together. And I think that's the only way forward. Paul, just listening to what Roger said there, he says it's not about EU politics and EU politicians. Um, so I'm very interested. You're based in the UK. What, what is life like for UK farmers? They, they're outside of this system now. Um, they've had Brexit. How are UK farmers faring? Are, are they better off? Uh, well, for, for starters, I will admit I would prefer to be within Europe. Um, our life would be significantly simpler. We'd have much easier trading conditions. Um, what it is, the, the only element that is a bit of a plus is the fact you get this down to basically a regional level and a regional level of responsibility that you probably don't have in Europe. So for an English farmer now, they have an English set of rules. Whether that's good or bad, I'm not entirely sure. Um, they are rapidly having to learn how they can embrace um, new environmental systems, but we share the same frustration of trading. And, and you know, I do think this. we do need to be honest with farmers that there will be a requirement to change. And, and the biggest limiting factor we face in the future is demographics. A lot of people are protesting because they cannot see a future for the next generation of young people, whether they're coming from within agriculture or from outside. But we are really struggling to compete against other industries to hold people in agriculture which is why so many people feel so uncertain for the future. Isabel, it seems like you look at the kind of the mechanics of what puts together a system that, that works. With, as we've seen, we've seen major incidents with coronavirus, with the war in Ukraine, which obviously have disrupted the entire system of how food is manufactured and, and, and delivered. Do you see this as, as kind of... Um, a one-off in the sense that we've had these major events that have changed the world we live in? Or has this been slowly getting worse and this was a ticking time bomb that was always going to come? Um, yes, I'd say I'd, I'd lean more to the, to the second uh, option, let's say. So obviously the invasion of Ukraine and the pandemic were massively disruptive events and we've seen others um, get uh, worse in the situation further. 
Um, however massive these shocks were particularly heavy blows because they um, fell on a system, an agricultural and food system that is structurally non-resilient. Um, and that uh, also further uh, provides a, a, a reason to uh, act and, and indicates that we need to act fast. Um, I completely agree with what Roger said earlier on about the Green Deal maybe even coming a bit too late. Um, the option of, of putting uh, the transition to sustainable agriculture and food systems that can make sure that our agricultural sector is resilient uh, in environmental and social terms, and that also means touching upon uh, Paul's reference to generational renewal, um, which goes through ensuring that agriculture offers attractive uh, livelihoods and business prospects. Um, and that means, uh, that will ensure that when future shocks continue to come, and they will, at least in, in, in environmental terms, because we already see crops and yields and, and farmers' incomes heavily disrupted across Europe. Uh, and I'm using Europe, uh, not only the EU, to really look at the whole continent. Um, these disruptions won't, won't get any easier. Um, we've, we've passed tipping points. We're pushing on planetary boundaries. We need a food system that can absorb those, those shocks. Uh, that can react to them fast enough. And that means looking at extremely lengthy, vulnerable um, trade and, and value chains. Uh, it means strengthening uh, local resilience and, and local agricultural and food systems. Uh, and it definitely means improving the, the, the environmental and social um, sustainability of, of, of our food system. That does require political courage. It requires uh, action on um, from the public authority side, and it requires public authorities to develop policies that are inclusive, that are founded on strong consensus built through dialogue. Um, and it does require ensuring that every stakeholder can play their part by uh, having the needed financial and technical support to do that. Roger, it's a problem for countries right across the EU. I thought the EU was about having a common policy for all the countries and they dealt with it in the, in the same way. But we're seeing some of the countries take their own unilateral action. The French Prime Minister, Gabriel Attal, has allocated 150 million euros. He's thrown money at the problem to try and appease the farmers. Uh, he's talked about enshrining food sovereignty into French law. Is that a good move or is, is he just appeasing them until just putting it out there, perhaps, until people have voted in the upcoming EU parliamentary elections? Well, it's, I don't think it's the case that um, it's one thing or the other, Neil. There's a European element and there's a national element. I'm not quite sure what the French Prime Minister means by giving back food sovereignty, because agriculture is a European, uh, is a European function. But it doesn't mean to say that he doesn't have any say over what happens. For example, he has a lot of say over taxes and he's reduced, he's extending exemptions on uh, the removal of a diesel uh, a tax and so on. There are things that he can do. But, you know, let's remember if the European Union wasn't there, we'd have lots of different national policies. It's, wouldn't, it's not that we wouldn't have any policy at all. So I think we need to get out of this sort of sterile debate about who's to blame and into looking for who is willing to take responsibility for what happens next. And we've had these protests. It's caught the imagination. I think the farmers have public support. The French government is engaged. The European Union is engaged. What actually needs to happen? I think, from what I've heard from Paul and other farmers and the young people I spoke to in Lithuania, Lithuania in the rural community this morning, they get it. They're willing to work with change, to make changes. And let's face it, farmers have already made a lot of changes, and they know that more are to come. But we have to have an open, honest discussion. We have to respect agreements that are made. And I think we have to say, about flag waving, that is about saying, you know, we, we need a food system that is sustainable, as Isabella is uh, saying. And all of us have a, a responsibility to contribute to that. I think uh, Roger, I'm sorry to interrupt you, because we've got about one minute to go. And I just want to give the final word, word to Paul to, give, to equal things out of it. Paul, how much power do farmers have at the moment? And how much... Have they lost to perhaps the retailers, the supermarkets? Well, that, that is always the eternal battle when you're dealing with global markets. And I think the frustration is if, if 
if we have and we're producing to the sort of same rules that imports are coming in on, then we'd feel a lot more comfortable. At the moment, we, we actually haven't got that. Uh, the retailers do have a vital role to play in this. I, I think they're aware of this because if they don't, they run the risk of empty shelves. And they are remarkably close to that. All of you, it's been a fascinating conversation. Really appreciate your input. We'll wrap it up there. Um, to Paul Temple, Isabel Pagliotta and Roger Casale, thank you so much. And indeed, thank you to you guys at home for watching. Uh, you can remember, follow us on Twitter, aka X, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Neil Harvey, and this was The Newsmakers. See you next time.